Hello, this is Scott Schweitzer and welcome to the Storage Developer Conference. Today I'm going to talk about smart NICs and smart SSDs and the future of smart acceleration. Uh, this is the abstract of the talk. I'm not going to dwell on this. You all can read it uh, some other time. So let's just jump right on in. So today we're going to do some quick uh, framing of the discussion, uh, go over what smart NICs are, go over smart SSDs and computational storage, and then talk about the rise of accelerators. So accelerators aren't new. Uh, mainframes have had them since the 1950s. Uh, these were expensive two-base systems, came out in 57, 58, a real beast of a mainframe weighing in at over a ton. Uh, but the interesting thing about the, this particular model of the uh, IBM 70, 709 is that uh, it supported overlapped I.O. And that allowed them to bring in intelligent controllers in the form of the IBM 7607. Uh, and that was probably one of the first examples of an accelerator, uh, an, an extra processor designed to uh, offload the main host uh, CPU from doing stuff. Uh, coincidentally, this was actually the first system to uh, support Fortran for those out there that are all-time programmers. On the server issue side of things, uh, this is something we want to keep an eye on, is uh, CPUs have scaled out extremely well. Um, you know, we're, we're up to 128 cores per uh, CPU, uh, we're probably going to go above that sometime in the near future, but we haven't scaled up much above 4.5 gigahertz. Uh, we, we do overclock, and there are examples of overclocking up to 7 gigahertz on some power platforms, uh, but for the most part, these aren't, you know, production clock frequencies, and we're kind of stuck in the 3 to 4.5 gigahertz rut, and so scale-up is really the only thing that uh, we have available to us. Uh, about 21 years ago this month, uh, NVIDIA introduced the GeForce 256 chip shown on the bottom right there in October uh, 1999. And for the past two decades, GPUs have kind of proved that there's a thirst for accelerators uh, in the market. And they've pretty much dominated in the high performance computing space. And they're starting to bleed into other markets as well, uh, crypto and others. Um, you know, for the past few years, everything has kind of become software defined. Uh, it's all about uh, software-defined, you know, composability, orchestration, and the desire is, is to build larger, more generic systems so that these can then be orchestrated to leverage uh, the entire infrastructure uh, to provide better overall solution performance. One last slide in this uh, framing space uh, around around uh, speed is there are three components uh, to speed, and that's you know essentially the CPUs, the disks, and networking. And there is memory too, and and this is kind of I think tracks along with CPUs. So we'll talk about this uh, uh, as well with CPUs. So CPU densities have have soared. Uh, you know it's undisputed fact that uh, Moore's law has has gone extremely well for us. You can see the chart on the bottom right. Uh, the y-axis is logarithmic. That's why it's kind of a linear slope uh, to that. And that represents densities of transistors for different processor architectures. And if you have the slide deck, you can expand that out. Uh, but what this essentially means is that we're well into the, you know, tens of billions of transistors uh, a single die, uh, which has allowed us to do some amazing things. Disks, on the meantime, uh, in the meantime, uh, disks have gone from spinning media, which we've had since the 50s, uh, to solid state drives. And in doing so, we've jumped three orders of magnitude in performance. Um, spinning disks were pretty much at the end of their uh, evolutionary curve. Uh, we've played every trick in the book that we can to get the most performance we can out of them. But, you know, when something is spinning, you can only spin things so fast before uh, you run into issues. And that affects access times. Uh, whereas with stored solid state drives, you know, you can have 64,000 IO queues, each queue with 64,000 entries. And you can have performance that just blows away uh, spinning disks. Uh, three orders of magnitude for access time is, is kind of the convention in the space. Finally, we have networking. Networking is, is probably the least discussed uh, for the most part, but the, probably one of the more interesting ones. We've kind of struggled along with gigabit ethernet uh, for quite a long time. Uh, you know, it, it had been around before the turn of the century, uh, but for the most part, uh, it, it still dominated the data center until about 2010 when most folks were moving over to 10 gig ethernet. Um, since then, we've had 25 gig ethernet and that's pretty much picked up on adoption around 2018 or so. And then with uh, 2020, 2021, 
we're actually starting to see pick up on a hard gig Ethernet. So uh, that's growing or starting to grow exponentially as well. And these things were all factors that are pushing hard down into this space uh, of performance. Now, one last uh, framing slide, and that is the corporate players in the space. If we look across the space, uh, the three big CPU guys, and I wouldn't have, a year ago, I wouldn't have thought of NVIDIA as a CPU guy. Um, you know, they do GPUs and all, but, you know, general purpose CPUs wasn't a, really their game. Uh, they're $300 billion in market cap uh, compared to Intel's 210 and AMD's 90. But the interesting thing is over the past weekend, they announced the acquisition of ARM or their intent to acquire ARM, which puts them right in the fold of uh, you know, CPU player uh, from a general purpose CPU as opposed to a specialty CPU. Um, on the electronic side of things, we have the other players that kind of sweep along the bottom. Uh, Samsung is, is kind of the big dog in that space, but they make a wide variety of different products uh, that go beyond, well beyond chips, you know, refrigerators and appliances, things like that. Um, you've got Broadcom and Qualcomm in the 100, $127 billion range, along with TI, and then you also have Marvell and Xilinx. Okay, so SmartNex. What's the big deal with SmartNex? So SmartNICs are to networking what GPUs are to high performance computing. Uh, SmartNICs arrive much later on the scene. Uh, that's allowed them uh, two decades of time for chip integration to increase geometrically. Uh, now that we're down to seven nanometers, we can put an off lot transistors on a chip. We have things like silicon interposers that allow us to uh, apply multiple chips within the same package. Uh, now there are some, some folks call them chiplets. Um, so that allows us to do very tight integration uh, of things. And then there's also the software angle on, on all of this. Uh, the software for integrating in coprocessors or accelerators has gotten extremely better. So arriving later in the market uh, allows us access to a wider portion of the market. Um, SmartNICs are going to apply across the entire data center. Another big advantage of SmartNICs is that they introduce the concept of a separate computational domain uh, to the server that doesn't or didn't really previously exist. I mean, if you look at a server, uh, they generally have something like a DRAC card, you know, Dell's remote access controller or, or some sort of autonomous little SOC uh, for doing system management that sits on its own dedicated gigabit ethernet port. Uh, but for the most part, the server is one big computational domain. And that becomes a problem when you get around to security. Um, and so if you can actually uh, use the SmartNIC itself as a computational domain, and from there uh, launch applications uh, into the host CPU complex, you can keep those domains separate. And if someone were to violate one, they, they wouldn't naturally be violating the other. Um, and also you could use it for orchestration. So you could actually have the SmartNIC uh, be uh, the controller, you know, the cluster controller, uh, to dispatch uh, pods or containers uh, on the on the x86 complex. Also, the SmartNICs uh, are are now starting to rival the uh, host CPUs in power. Um, granted, they're not up to a, you know 128 core uh, CPU yet. That's, that's that's probably still a little ways off, but uh, we're getting there fast as we're making the jump to uh, seven nanometer. Uh, you're going to start to see some very impressive uh, core counts, uh, impressive amounts of programmable logic, uh, AI engines, and other computational uh, resources available. Also, um, SmartNICs benefit from uh, advances in PCI Express and the protocols attached to PCI Express, and we'll talk about that shortly. So who's pushing for all this stuff? You know, obviously there has to be you know, a consumer for these products. Otherwise, you know, there wouldn't be a market and nobody would, you know, be interested in buying them. Well, um, the big two are financials and hyperscalers. Financials are your big banks, your high frequency traders, and your exchanges. And why these guys are pushing for smart mix is uh, fairly obvious. Uh, what they're looking for out of it is uh, to dollarize time right? Uh, the faster they can come to a decision on something uh, and trade on it, the more money potentially they can make. 
Uh, so time is money to them. Uh, if you look at electronic trading today, um, if you're trading using a normal um, accelerated NIC and you're doing everything through the host CPU complex, you're talking in the microsecond range, uh, several microseconds, um, you know, basically a microsecond half round trip uh, to get the data in and out and then a couple microseconds to run through all the host code uh, to you know, handle the feed normalization and, you know, trade book and all that and decide what, uh, what the trade is going to be and then uh, execute it back into the exchange. If you do this all on a smart NIC or an FPGA based uh, smart NIC, you can uh, be executing trades in under hundred nanoseconds. We've seen examples uh, of that. Um, you know, worst case, you could be doing things like feed handlers or risk jacking and all that kind of stuff uh, within the NIC. So the financials have really been pushing uh, for smart NICs for the past half dozen years or so. Uh, also, there are the hyperscalers. These are the big data center managers, the, the Googles, the Facebooks, uh, the LinkedIn's, the Microsoft's. Uh, so the hyperscalers uh, are pushing for this. And the reason why they're pushing for it is the data center tax concept. Um, when you are a hyperscaler, you're making extensive use of virtualization and containerization. And when you use those technologies, you're also virtualizing the network. Uh, and in virtualizing the network and managing that virtualized network, you sometimes consume up to a third of the host CPU cycles in managing uh, that virtualized network. So by moving that workload off to a smart NIC, you can reclaim those host CPU cycles uh, and apply them back to customer workloads. Finally, there's streamers uh, in this work from home uh, climate that we all live in today. We're making extensive use of streaming video either you know, for Zoom chats like like this one, or for, um, you know, things like Hulu and Netflix and Amazon Prime uh, for watching videos. And all of that streaming takes an enormous amount of computational workload because what happens is video is delivered in one format. Uh, it typically needs to be decoded back to a raw format and then transcoded into a half a dozen different uh, adaptive bit rate um, formats so that the video can be watched on a variety of different displays. Um, you'll notice, you know, if you're a Netflix user, for example, they have 4K content, right? And then the default content is 1K. Uh, and then what you don't know is they also have content at 720, 480, and I think they even support 320 still. Um, so that's all adaptive bitrate stuff and transcoding. And, uh, you know, programmable logic can do transcoding at uh, a 20th the speed of normal CPUs and do it at roughly the same um, same power budget uh, for the same um, same workload. So you know, twenty times more, but the same amount of power to do one as it would on a host CPU. So let's look at the architecture of SmartNICs. Right, there are three planes uh, used within the SmartNIC architecture. There is the management plane, and that's what uh, normal humans like uh, you and I would use. Your sysadmins. Uh, this is where you're going to execute uh, command line instructions uh, or uh, applications that use a RESTful API into the NIC. Uh, even some older protocols like uh, you know, uh, SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol, uh, for managing the control plane, right? And the control plane is what tells them tells the NIC what to do, uh, essentially. And in the control plane, that's more um, program to program uh, exchange of data. You know, so this is OSPF and BGP, OpenFlow, SDF, that kind of stuff. Um, and so the control plane is what uh, twiddles the bits for the data plane. This is where that real action occurs uh, and data is transformed or packets are, are dropped um, if they're a security threat. Uh, and so, you know, packets come in on the data plane and they exit on the data plane and then they go through the PCIe bus, the host complex and come back through the PCIe bus back into the, into the NIC. Uh, here we are executing uh, P4 instructions, uh, potentially IP tables, OBS, DPDK type stuff, uh, BPF, rounding tables, all that kind of stuff can be offloaded into the data plane. Now, if we look at the building blocks uh, that make up a smart NIC, uh, there are essentially three categories of building blocks. Uh, we've got uh, cores, CPU cores like ARM and and MIPS 64. We've got hard logic, uh, stuff that's instantiated in actual circuits within the ASIC. Uh, we've got programmable logic like FPGAs. We've got memory 
and we've also got uh, interconnect logic, which, which kind of falls into the, the hard logic category. Um, also, we have protocols, right? There's uh, PCI Express, and then with PCI Express comes some uh, software protocols that sit on top of that, CXL, C6. And then uh, there are the networking protocols, right? Ethernet, uh, Infinite Band, UDP, TCP. Um, and then the higher level application protocols like HTML3, which includes Quick, uh, and you can do uh, TLS offload or kernel TLS offload, and we'll talk about that uh, in a bit as well. And then there's the ecosystem stuff, right? This is what where the rubber hits the road and where developers get involved and third parties. Uh, what languages are you supporting on the smart NICs? Um, you know, what type of software development kits are you providing? Uh, you know, for apps that are developed, do you have an app store? How do you make those apps available to customers? Uh, are customers allowed to write their own apps? You know, so there's a whole um, ecosystem around um, SmartNix or will be uh, an ecosystem around SmartNix. So let's jump in and actually take a look at uh, the six most popular SmartNix uh, that are available today. We'll start with uh, Broadcom's Stingray. Uh, Broadcom is, is kind of the old standard in the market. Uh, they've been doing mix forever. Um, and what they have here is a single chip, in, uh, single chip implementation, uh, probably one of the leanest and meanest uh, out there. Uh, it's got its own hardware flow classifier that's uh, probably third or fourth generation by now. Uh, it was used in, in prior products and has evolved fairly well over time. Uh, they have eight ARM cores uh, for doing uh, control plane stuff for the most part. And they've got some IP accelerator blocks in there for uh, encrypt, decrypt, and uh, file management and that kind of stuff, um, Ethernet, PCI Express. Uh, and then they've got two banks of DDR that can be used by the ARM cores uh, for control plane stuff. And you can see all of that uh, in the chip diagram to the right here. But for the most part, the whole thing happens within the uh, BCM 5880. 802H. Uh, so that's the Stingray by Broadcom. Newest kit on the block, and newest as in brand new, can still smell the uh, new Nick smell on it, uh, is Fungible. Fungible came out uh, at Hot Chips last month, uh, middle of last month. Uh, they came out stealth mode. Uh, essentially, what Fungible has is a SmartNIC that is based on MIPS 64 cores. Uh, they're the only ones that uh, are using MIPS 64 at this point. Uh, and they arrange multiple cores, uh, each into data clusters, and they've got eight data clusters. Uh, they've got a high speed chip network that ties all that together. Uh, they've got schedulers and control logic, as well as uh, DDR4 and HBM memory uh, that's available to all of this. And then they've got um, uh, heart logic for. Uh, encrypt, decrypt uh, in the network units as well as the uh, file logic. And then they've got uh, PCI Express controllers, uh, multiple PCI Express controllers. Uh, these guys are the new kid on the block. Um, they, like I said, they just came out of stealth mode. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how they move forward um, over the next year or two. They're doing some interesting stuff with uh, UDP acceleration that requires their technology on both ends. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how customers view that and how adoption goes. Uh, another standard in the industry is Intel. Intel's obviously been making NICs for uh, <clears throat> quite some time. And their Vista Creek or their N3000 product is, is their current smart NIC, NIC generation. Um, it is by far the most complex smart NIC uh, that's out there today. It's a seven chip product. Uh, so they've got uh, six uh, A6 and an FPGA, all on the same board. Um, fortunately for them, uh, five of the uh, A6 are theirs. Uh, one of them is uh, the one that's not theirs is the PEX 8747 PCI switch chip, um, and then the FPGA is theirs, and it came through the Altera acquisition uh, half a dozen years or so ago. And then they've got two banks of DDR4. So uh, like Xilinx, they are the only player with FPGA logic at the heart of their SmartNIC approach. And so what they do is they bring packets in uh, from the QSFP 28s through retimers uh, into the FPGA, and then they steer them 
uh, at the FPGA where they can, you know, do um, any sort of packet analysis or uh, transforms on the packets or actions on the packets. And then they can route the packets over to uh, an Intel XL710 for additional NIC processing. And the Intel XL710 then is connected to the PEC switch. Uh, and that goes out the PCIe bus. Uh, the uh, FPGA could also just handle the product packets directly and put them on the PCI Express bus. Uh, so there is a, a tremendous amount of flexibility in the implementation uh, that Intel has chosen here with the FPGA. Uh, this is a different approach. And as we'll talk uh, later, FPGAs afford a, a very wide and deep uh, pipeline architecture for uh, executing uh, on packets. So uh, we'll roll that. Next up is Bluefield 2 by NVIDIA, formerly Mellanox. Uh, Bluefield 2 is an elevation or an elevation evolution of Bluefield. Uh, Bluefield was obviously the predecessor to Bluefield 2. Uh, before that, it was called Tylera. Uh, came in through uh, an acquisition that Mellanox had done years ago. Uh, <clears throat> I think it was Easy Chips uh, at the time. Uh, but what um, NVIDIA has done here is they've taken the uh, Connect X6 logic, which is extremely well proven in the industry, um, and replaced the Tylera uh, M piped technology um, on the network side of things. <clears throat> Brought that in. Excuse me for one second. Brought that in as the packet classifiers. <clears throat> and then they can forward that back out. <clears throat> oh, excuse me to PCI Express <clears throat> and along the way, the way they have um, eight ARM cores uh, for doing control plane management um, you know, of, of the packets and some DDR4 uh, memory for those uh, control plane cores. Uh, they also have uh, hard logic for encrypt decrypt, including TLS. And they recently announced uh, support for kernel TLS, so they can offload uh, uh, the TLS encode decode into the NIC um, through kernel TLS. So these guys are going to be the ones to watch from an uh, install base point of view. Um, Mellanox has done an extremely good job of pushing Bluefield 2 into the data center, and there are a number of wins in that space. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how they move forward. Okay, the second new kid on the block, and new in the sense that they've been around only for about a year or so now, is Pensando and their Naples uh, chip. Uh, Pensando is using P4 as the programming language for their data plane processing engine. And P4 is the trendy hot new language for um, managing network packets. Um, everybody's moving towards it, or a lot of people are moving towards it, not necessarily everybody, but a lot of people are moving towards it. Uh, what Pensando has done here is they've got a P4 processing engine. They've got some ARM cores on the side for control plane stuff. Um, they've got obviously packet buffers and memory. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how this takes off. Uh, these are a bunch of ex Cisco guys. They've still got strong ties back to Cisco. Um, and this may, who knows, someday become, you know, Cisco's smart neck of choice. Um, but these guys are going to be uh, interesting to watch over the next uh, year or so. And finally, we have uh, Xilinx. <clears throat> With Xilinx, um, we've got the U25 um, smart NIC. And here what uh, Xilinx chose to do is they, it, it's similar in some ways to Intel's uh, N3000. They've got uh, an FPGA chip at the heart of the architecture, uh, but it's a single chip. And they've got a single chip um, Ethernet controller uh, it's the, it's uh, Solifer's uh, previous X2 chip. Uh, so that's an extremely well-proven chip in the marketplace. Uh, and that's coupled up with a uh, Xilinx Zinc chip that is, is extremely well-proven. Uh, the Zinc chip has four ARM cores on it. It's a complete system on a chip. Uh, those ARM cores are control plane activity. Uh, they have access to uh, two banks of memory, uh, two gig and four gig. Uh, one of them is available, the FPGA, and the other one's available, the ARM cores. Um, and what that allows uh, them to do is uh, much, much in the same way as the uh, Intel N3000. Packets can be transformed directly off the uh, SFP28 interfaces. 
uh, and sent down to the PCIe bus to the host CPU complex, <clears throat> or they can be uh, shunted over to the X2 controller, uh, let the X2 controller process them and then put them on the PCI Express bus. And then it obviously works the other way as well. Uh, this approach is extremely flexible because it allows you to put logic into the FPGA to manipulate packets uh, and then uh, shoot them over to uh, the PCI Express bus to either the host CPU complex or potentially another uh, adapter on the PCI Express bus. And we'll talk about that uh, in a couple of minutes. Okay, some of the evolving issues in the SmartNIC space and all this stuff is, is very important and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out uh, over the next couple of years. Uh, the first one was brought up on a, a IEEE Hot Interconnect panel that I um, was fortunate enough to host uh, a couple of weeks ago. And that was a separate computational domain, right? The SmartNIC can be viewed as a separate computer within the server itself much like, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the iDRAC, the um, you know, remote access and control little processor that runs on the server motherboard uh, that allows you to power the server up and down and do some basic BIOS configuration and see the console, that kind of stuff. Um, you could actually put that you know, logic into the SmartNIC such that you could use the SmartNIC as a separate computational domain to launch other applications within the host, right? And if the SmartNIC were to get compromised, the host would not be compromised, right? Um, also, you could use the SmartNIC uh, for orchestration and have uh, controller requests come into the SmartNIC and dispatch containers or pods uh, directly into the host CPU complex from the SmartNIC. Right, so those are interesting concepts that uh, we're going to see come up in the next couple of years. Uh, P4 and PNAs, uh, PNA stands for programmable, or excuse me, portable NIC architecture. Uh, P4 is obviously the uh, programming language uh, that is of choice right now for networking. And so uh, P4 is being adopted, uh, as I mentioned before, with, by Pensando, but uh, Xilinx is, gonna, is using it extensively in its uh, new line of smart NICs uh, that are coming out. Uh, others are picking up on it. And then this whole portable NIC architecture is a way to define one or more NICs, uh, soft NICs uh, within uh, a system that uh, could do different tasks. So you can almost carve up uh, a physical NIC into multiple soft NICs um, and then assign those soft NICs to different applications and steer traffic through the, that methodology. Uh, cores and planes, obviously, um, you know, some of the ven vendors are scaling up the number of cores. Uh, Broadcom and uh, NVIDIA are both uh, doubling their core count as they make the jump to seven nanometer. Um, you know, they're, it's questionable whether they're going to start applying some of those cores to the data plane. Um, everybody knows it's not the right thing to do, but on the other hand, you know, they need computational resource sometimes to manage those packets. So it'll be interesting to see how that uh, turns out down the road. Uh, I'll touch on protocols in a minute, uh, but these are ways to tie multiple NICs together. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And then there's security and orchestration. Uh, security being, uh, you know, managing the security domain from within the NIC itself, uh, using the NIC as a secure enclave uh, that is separate apart from the host uh, complex. You can use the NIC as a hardware uh, key manager if you wish to. Uh, and then orchestration, obviously, for uh, launching uh, pods or containers directly from uh, the NIC into the host CPU complex. So let's talk about smart SSDs and computational storage. Um, FPGAs have been used in storage for years. Um, they've been used in controllers uh, to allow the controllers to do a wide variety of things. You know, early implementations of, of ASICs are often done in FPGAs. Um, so, you know, if you want to do RAID and things like that, erasure coding, uh, that, you know, has been done in the past in um, FPGA-based or flash controllers, as they were sometimes called. Uh, this allows us to uh, do a wide variety of, of things with the storage array from uh, cache offloading um, to RAID, data reduction, and things like that. The, the benefit that FPGAs bring to 
uh, computational storage, and, and this is something that uh, you know most people may not be aware of, is it's a different computational model than normal CPU-based processing, as we talked about before with cores on the um, smart NICs, right? Uh, with FPGAs, you take a program, and instead of executing the program instruction by instruction, and having to go out to memory to fetch each instruction as you as you crunch through the instructions and go out to memory to fetch data and all of that. With FPGA, you actually take that whole instruction flow and you boil it down into gate logic. Um, the actual, you know, ands and ors and logical instructions that would make up um, that program once it's been boiled down and reduced um, to its core. And what that does is it gets rid of all of those memory accesses and allows you to uh, dramatically pipeline the execution of data so that in a sense, the FPGA acts like a black box that represents your program. And you basically put your data in and you get your data out, uh, transformed the way you want it to be transformed. And that's why these things are so blindingly fast at doing things like transcoding or genomics, uh, things like that. And they can, you know, have been applied, as I mentioned before, to storage for the last two decades. Um, so if we look at it from a, a more storage specific example, right, what we have here is uh, the ability for the FPGA to handle a wide range of tasks, storage tasks, and be fully reconfigurable um, along its product lifecycle. Uh, and while you know, delivering ASIC or hardware-based performance uh, and, and do all of this massively in a massively parallel way, right? Uh, that's another thing about ASICs is, you know, an ASIC is what an ASIC is the day it ships. With an FPGA, it's reconfigurable uh, during the lifetime of the product. And so you can add more functionality over the lifetime of the product just by flashing in new uh, firmware into the FPGA uh, and you can have multiple parallel pipelines uh, within the FPGA to do different things. Uh, in this example, you know, we've added an, an encryption accelerator, um, you know, after the computational storage was developed. And then we added a decryption and, and accelerator. And then finally, there's an analytics engine that was added, right? And each one of these takes up additional FPGA space, uh, but allows us to pipeline the execution and deliver performance uh, at the same speed that you would normally expect to come from hardware. Um, it also allows us to adapt to changing compression algorithms along the way. I mean, today's compression algorithm is not tomorrow's compression algorithm. You know, GZIP, you know, was popular one day, um, you know, and then Brotley, I believe is how it's pronounced, was, was popular shortly after that, uh, leading up to the zip line accelerator. So, you know, just like video transcoding, um, we've had various different video algos along the way. We've had various different, um, you know, compression algorithms along the way. And doing this in FPGA logic allows us to update uh, those algorithms uh, as, as they are improved. So computation of storage drive, um, this is the process where we uh, put the controller, uh, it becomes an FPGA controller, and um, that is, is actually put into the drive itself, right? And we can put programming logic within that FPGA to offload different tasks. If we want to take a drive and we want to uh, encode or decode video as it enters or leaves the drive, or if we want to um, do compression of data as it enters and leaves the drive, or if we want to change the addressability of the data within the drive, um, we can do all that through a computational storage device. And we have a couple of, of great partners in this space, uh, Samsung at ScaleFlux. Uh, you can buy uh, computational storage drives from them. Uh, and that's, that's kind of where these are going. So these are accelerators, but they're accelerators that are buried into the actual drive hardware itself, uh, whether they, they look like NVMe drives or classic SSDs. Um, you know, it's, it's buried right in there with it and it sits alongside the controller. Uh, and then there's also computational storage processors. Uh, these are, uh, you know, um, separate boards 
that are managing the storage, much like a controller. Uh, we've got partners in the space in the form of Bitware and Adenicom um, that put these products out. Uh, this allows us to uh, accelerate the um, writing the data to storage, doing some of those transforms we mentioned earlier uh, in storage and do peer-to-peer -peer transfers between storage. Uh, and then there are computational storage arrays, right? And that's where we put the FPGA in front of the whole array uh, and let the FPGA manage the array uh, and do, you know, RAID and other uh, erasure coding, other tasks within the FPGA. Uh, we've got partners in the space in the form of Bitware. Okay, so let's get to the rise of accelerators. So uh, in the accelerator space, we've got a couple things uh, pressing in on us. Uh, we've got PCIe Gen 5, PCIe peer-to-peer, -peer, and then two new protocols that uh, you may not be aware of, CXL and C6, and we'll talk about those in a second. So PCIe 5, um, with every turn of the PCIe crank, we double the data rate. Um, so with PCIe 5, we'll get the double speed bump um, of PCIe 4. So now we're into the uh, hundreds of gigabytes uh, per second of uh, hundreds of gigabytes, you know, something like that. Uh, gigabytes per second for 16 lane uh, Gen 5. Uh, we'll have support uh, for PCIe peer to peer that, that kind of exists in PCIe 4. Um, it showed up with a kernel enhancement uh, that came out uh, last year. Uh, and then we've got new protocols, uh, C6 and CXL, which I'll go into in a second, uh, that are supported on PCIe 5. Uh, PCIe peer-to-peer, -peer, this came out uh, with Linux, uh, Linux kernel update in 2018. Uh, this allows uh, two PCI uh, Express devices to talk to each other uh, on the PCI Express bus. So accelerators can talk to NVMe storage, for example, that's probably the best use case. Um, it used to be before the kernel mod, you kind of needed to control both ends of things. Uh, after the kernel mod, there was some standardization and this has allowed you to um, you know, have an accelerator from one company talk to an NVMe uh, drive from another. Uh, but it's, it's only, it only handles acceleration between two devices. So uh, it's a good point to point solution. Um, Compute Express Link uh, is, has been around for the last couple of years and it's been in, uh, it's an open consortium of, of uh, companies. And the objective of this was to come up with a better way for accelerators on the PCI Express bus to work with the host. Um, CXL is a master slave model. Um, you know, the host is the master and the adapter is a slave uh, for the most part. Uh, it's cache coherent. Uh, this allows um, the accelerator to have access to the CPU's cache and main memory. And it allows the host CPU to have access to the accelerator's memory. And so what that does is it enables um, high, high degree of uh, data exchange <coughs> between the two computational platforms. The problem is though, it, it's only a one-to-one -one type of thing, uh, one accelerator to one host. So it's, it's fine if your solution, it just needs a GPU card or just needs an FPGA card or you know, one device, smart NIC, whatever, smart storage. Um, but if you want to aggregate multiple devices together, you can't use this technology, right? So uh, along came Cache Coherent Interconnect for Accelerators, C6. Uh, this is a peer-to-peer -peer model. Um, and there's actually a couple of different um, versions, not versions, I should say, a couple different use cases where this can be um, uh, utilized. Uh, it can be utilized in a master slave kind of a processor to accelerator model uh, as shown uh, in the first first diagram on the bottom there. It could also be processor to memory um, much like master slave but it can also be processor to accelerator and to memory right in kind of a, a star-like configuration or it can be done in a daisy chain uh, approach where uh, it could be processor to processor and also processor to accelerator to accelerator to accelerator. Um, and that's where things begin to get very interesting. Uh, also, uh, it supports a NUMA model. Uh, this is non-uniform memory access. 
uh, which allows you to take all of the storage in all of these different accelerator devices and drop it into a single virtual addressing space. Um, and that allows different programs to access different data on different devices. Um, yeah, directly through you know, normal conventional programming routines. So <clears throat> let's talk about uh, accelerators from uh, you know, kind of a higher level point of view. We talked about the separate computational domain a couple times already, uh, but I think that's going to be one of the biggies that we see cropping up over the next couple of years is implementations where people are using uh, an accelerator or a smart NIC uh, as the controller for the host itself, right? And a controller in the macro sense where it's controlling all of the resources of the server, not just you know, basic power on, power off of different things, but it's allocating computational tasks out to different uh, accelerators within the box or uh, orchestrating uh, applications that utilize multiple accelerators uh, through a uniform or a NUMA uh, memory architecture. Uh, we're going to see uh, the rise of uh, KTLS, right? Kernel based um, <coughs> TLS uh, security. Uh, getting offloaded to these accelerators. Um, TLS is kind of computationally intense. And if we can move that off the host CPU uh, to a dedicated accelerator that's got uh, logic, hard logic for doing TLS uh, encrypt decrypt, uh, that would dramatically improve the overall performance of any solution. Uh, another biggie uh, that we haven't talked about yet is confidential computing consortium. And this is, um, an open consortium of folks that are looking at how to um, improve secure enclaves uh, within a computing architecture. Uh, so that if, um, you know, so that if, if one enclave is compromised, it doesn't affect the other enclaves on the computing device, right? We've seen in the past with uh, Heartbleed and uh, Spectre and some of these other uh, vulnerabilities that have been out there that uh, one application could um, uh, compromise uh, the host CPU such that it gains access to another application's uh, data and storage and keys and, and other content. And this just is, is something that needs to get locked down. And so Intel and AMD both have architectures around this. But uh, what we want to do is be able to extend those architectures to other computing devices like accelerators. Um, so the accelerators can either share a secure enclave, um, <clears throat> much like a skiff, you know, within a building where a whole building is a skiff. So you've got multiple conference rooms that are part of the same skiff, right? Or, you know, setting up individual secure enclaves uh, within the server. Uh, for different tasks, right? So uh, the Confidential Computing Consortium is looking into these kinds of things, and I think they'll play into uh, the accelerator space sometime in the coming years. Also, and I touched on this a couple times already, is orchestration, right? Uh, you know, when you want to launch multiple um, containers or pods, you want to be able to run that orchestration in a secure environment uh, that's trusted, and you want to dispatch those applications in the most efficient manner possible, right? And, you know, if you were to do that within the host CPU complex and the host CPU complex gets compromised, you could potentially compromise uh, other um, items, other, other namespaces within that, uh, within that host. So what you want to do is be able to orchestrate those kind of from afar and, uh, limit the, uh, the compromise capability. Finally, there's a Xilinx manager. A Xilinx manager is a way for dispatching uh, code uh, into um, FPGAs through a containerized model, um, you know, over, over the network. And uh, that'll be something interesting to see over the next couple, couple of years. So let's look at an example <clears throat> of uh, smart NICs and where we're going with this kind of technology and where, where, um, where we can expect uh, C6 uh, and CXL uh, to be applied. This is actually a, a C6 example. 
<clears throat> so what we have here is a, a normal server that's got uh, two sockets. And we have an application that uh, theoretically runs almost entirely uh, within the accelerators, right? Uh, we have a video uh, feed coming in from the network somewhere, a uh, smart camera somewhere that's been encoded. Uh, that video feed comes into the smart NIC. The smart NIC has in it a video decode for that camera. Uh, it decodes the video uh, in real time uh, and it puts the frames of the video into a frame buffer uh, such that a, another accelerator card on the PCI Express bus um, can access those frames. Now the frames could be stored in uh, HBM on the smart NIC. They could be stored in, um, you know, storage on, on another accelerator card. It really does, doesn't matter that much. Uh, but anyway, the, the smart NIC is doing the video decode. Um, it's doing the networking component and then it's doing the video decode and putting them in a buffer. Um, then you, you then have an AI or, or ML application that say is looking for a face or a license plate or, um, you know, some sort of, uh, theft at a cash register or whatever the, the case may be. Um, uh, it's looking through that frame buffer for specific things, right? Uh, once it's done and it's looked through that frame, right? It marks the frame as consumed or used, right? And there would be another accelerator application that would then pick that frame up and begin the encode process uh, and encode that frame such that it can be stored into a smart SSD and also be viewable uh, in, in, you know, uh, multiple number of uh, bit rates. Uh, so that way, uh, you know, security guard or whatever could be watching it, you know, on a, on a laptop or his phone or, you know, um, you know, computer or a series of monitors, right? So you're going to want the data uh, available in multiple bit rates. So what you've got here is essentially uh, three different uh, accelerators that are operating on essentially the same data uh, and then storing it off to a smart SSD or, or you know, other storage um, for future use. And the benefit of that is that none of this data is getting bopped around, you know, back and forth between the host, C host CPU. Right, it would exist in the NUMA architecture uh, on one of the devices, uh, whichever device has you know the adequate space to handle it, probably the smart NIC or whatever. Um, and then it, it it's getting moved around as it's needed, but between the PCIe device and the accelerator that is working on it through NUMA, the NUMA memory architecture. Um, and then in the end, it gets stored off to the smart SSD. So each one of those transactions should be as efficient as possible, and it'll only be looking for doing, you know, what it needs to do. Um, so you're minimizing the amount of data movement uh, over the PCI Express bus. Uh, you're really not getting the host CPU involved in the actual process. And, you know, the, the net result is that you'll be able to process much more video, much faster. Uh, and stored out more quickly than you can currently do that today, uh, having the host CPU involved in everything, right? So this will allow you real-time requirements for things like, you know, managing hundreds of cameras at, at the Olympics or within a big, uh, vast complex um, and, and doing all of this uh, computational work in real time. So more resources. Um, if you're really interested in smart NICs, uh, I've only touched on a lot of the concepts today because I only had a, a few minutes to, to do that. Uh, we have a series of articles uh, written uh, on smart NICs, you know, what makes a smart NIC smart, um, what's the difference between a smart NIC and a regular NIC, um, you know, the shift um, from uh, smart NICs to FPGAs and how they may dominate, as well as uh, what, what's going on with C6 and CXL and smart NIC architectures. So we've got those articles. These are clickable from the, um, the PowerPoint or PDF. And then also we had uh, an IEEE Hot Air Connects panel uh, at Hot Air Connects 2020 uh, a couple weeks ago. You can click on that link and that will take you to the YouTube video of the panel uh, for more information. Appreciate your time today. And if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you for attending.